A continuación, les presento una conversación con el Dr. Niari, un distinguido neurocientífico y profesor asociado en la prestigiosa Universidad de Yale. El Dr. Ari ha realizado importantes contribuciones científicas en los campos de la neurociencia y la salud mental, enfocándose particularmente en los mecanismos neuronales subyacentes a la adicción y la depresión, así como en el impacto de las comunidades religiosas en la salud mental. Su investigación abarca el estudio de la fe y su influencia positiva en la salud mental. El trabajo del Dr. Ari va más allá del laboratorio, ya que se involucra con diversas comunidades para comprender y mejorar los resultados de la salud mental. Ha recibido numerosos reconocimientos por su trabajo y es una voz respetada tanto en círculos académicos como religiosos. Personalmente, encuentro el enfoque y el trabajo del Dr. Ari tanto inspirador como esclarecedor, como alguien que valora profundamente tanto la investigación científica como la comprensión espiritual. Su trabajo tiene el potencial de arrojar luz sobre la compleja interacción entre la neurociencia y la fe. Para aquellos interesados en aprender más sobre el trabajo del Dr. Ari, recomiendo encarecidamente sus publicaciones y conferencias recientes, que profundizan las complejidades de su investigación y sus implicaciones para nuestras comunidades. Si disfrutan de esta conversación, les invito a convertirse en contribuyentes mensuales de nuestra plataforma a través de Facebook, YouTube e Instagram. Su apoyo es fundamental para que podamos continuar trayéndoles conversaciones de alta calidad con expertos de diversas áreas. Agradecemos enormemente su apoyo continuo. Y ahora, aquí está mi conversación con el Dr. Niari. Hi everyone, and welcome to God Science, Science, Culture, and Theology from a Christian Perspective. My name is Christian Jimenez, and I'm the founder and host of this platform. Today, I'm pleased to introduce a very special guest, a person from, from the first conversation I had with him, immediately showed the qualities that distinguish him. Dr. Adi is a Yale professor, neuroscientist, and mental health advocate. As a sought-after speaker, Dr. Addy engages audiences through his expertise in the brain biology of anxiety, depression, and addiction. His familiarity with effective psychological interventions, his perspective as a black scientist amidst ongoing ra racism and racial injustices, and as a person of faith. His research and community work has garnered national media attention, including coverage by NPR, Newsday, the NFLPA, The Source Magazine, Chuck Norris, Relevant Magazine, Proud Magazine, and others. Dr. Adi is the creator and host of powerful town hall events. He has built a unique partnership between scientists, uh, clinicians, educators, faith leaders, entertainers, professional athletes, and community and mental health advocacy groups. In these engaging uh, town conversations, panelists discuss topics at the intersection of neuroscience, mental health, faith, culture, and social justice. So Dr. Adi, welcome again. It is a pleasure a blessing and a privilege to have you on our platform. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, even in the first correspondence that we had, even before we talked, I was very grateful for all that you're doing for so many people and for bringing these two aspects together to have this God Science platform. I know it's been impacting a lot of people and look forward to being able to hopefully contribute a little bit to that today as well. Again, um, I would like to start first by talking about your uh, scientific work as a neuroscientist. I have already mentioned the extensive work that you do, a little bit about your laboratory, your research, which is extremely interesting and important to the community in our society as a whole. Yeah, so I can describe some of the work we do from a very big picture perspective. We're focused on three main areas, anxiety, depression, and addiction. So as a neuroscientist, what we're doing in my laboratory in particular is really trying to understand what happens in the brain during any of those three mental health states, mental health challenges or disorders as they're often characterized in the medical literature. Um, and so from, a, from that standpoint, we're really focused on what's the underlying brain biology that actually allows those illnesses to emerge in the first place. And so <clears throat> a lot of that work, we're thinking about what the people have done in the field previously, but also trying to understand Are there certain chemical messenger systems in the brain that are acting differently? Are there different circuits and pathways in the brain that are acting differently? And one thing that I think sometimes surprises people is that we can actually do some of those experiments actually looking at behavior in rats and mice. Now, often that surprises people initially, but if I'm giving a talk, I'll say, I'll have people say, what are some of the behaviors that you think about when you think about depression or when you think about anxiety? or if you think about substance use and misuse. <clears throat> and oftentimes people will have things that will come to mind. They'll think about somebody who perhaps lacks motivation if they're struggling with depression um, and has a hard time just 
maybe even getting out of bed or getting involved in certain tasks, or someone who's anxious and feels very uncomfortable in certain situations, <clears throat> or someone who doesn't pursue the, the joys of life in the same way they did before. Of course, with substance use, that can be excessive substance use. That can sometimes be people using substances instead of attending to other responsibilities. That can be things like relapse. That can be things like withdrawal. And so we can actually study those same types of behaviors in rodents as well. So if we give the rodents a chance to drink something that's very sugary, which they like, as we like as humans as well, sometimes if they've been through a lot of different stressors, they may not pursue that sweet drink as much, or they won't show as much motivation to expend a lot of effort to get a reward they like. The animals will also take substances that people will take. They also will exhibit relapse behavior. And so what that allows us to do is then to be able to use some of our biological and neuroscience tools to say what's happening in the brain when they're changing that behavior in response to stress, for instance. And so a lot of our work has focused on certain pathways in the brain that are implicated. What we're trying to do is, again, understand what's happening in terms of the brain biology, but also think about whether we can identify ways to have new therapies or medications to help with some of these challenges. So to give one example, some of the behaviors that we're looking at, we are also using an, an FDA approved medication that's used for hypertension. So actually the whole purpose of that medication is actually to help people who have hypertension, have high blood pressure, but it acts, it does that effect by working on certain proteins in the heart proteins that are actually known as calcium channels. So they let calcium in and out of the heart, which is important for the heart's electrical activity. But those same proteins also exist in the brain. And there's a lot of evidence from the scientific literature, from the clinical literature that shows that those proteins may also be important and be implicated in things like substance use and substance misuse and things like depression and things like bipolar disorder. So what we're doing now is seeing what happens when there are these changes in behavior around things related to addiction, depression, and anxiety, and seeing whether some of our tools that we can use can actually target those same channels in the brain to actually decrease craving, to decrease relapse, to actually decrease the anxiety that people have after lots of stress, or the anxiety that people have when they've used a substance for a while and they've stopped using the substance. We're then able to take the studies that we do in the rats, partner with our clinician colleagues like psychiatrists and psychologists, and then actually perform experiments in people to see whether using that same agent that's already FDA approved can actually alleviate some of the symptoms that people experience when they're going through a, a period of depression or heightened anxiety or substance misuse. And so that's just one practical example of how we take the science that we can understand from the brain biology and then apply it within the laboratory setting and then also collaborate with clinicians to have that thing move forward as well. The other brief piece I'll mention, we're also doing a lot of work around nicotine use as well. And so as your audience may know, the e-cigarette market has really grown exponentially over the last decade. Um, we've been involved in some of that work, again, funded by the FDA to actually look and see how flavors, you can get almost 10,000 different flavors at this point in the e-cigarettes might actually impact nicotine use. So there's two sides to that. On the one hand, some of the uh, manufacturers and people have talked about having people who smoke cigarettes who might transition to the e-cigarettes. The same time, you also have young people as young as 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and high schoolers who are using e-cigarettes who may not have started to use those e-cigarettes if those flavors weren't available. So again, we're trying to see how do those flavors impact the effect of nicotine in the brain and also impact whether people are actually tr starting to use or take nicotine, maybe even impact withdrawal, impact relapse. And so again, another example of where we're understanding the science of both behavior and what's happening in the brain to try and move things forward in terms of our understanding and also to help people with whatever they might be navigating at that particular time. That's incredible, the kind of work that you're doing. I remember mm -hmm. listening to, to a, uh, one of your lectures and you mentioned uh, indeed that nicotine perhaps is not a substance that per se costs like a really, really high effect on, on, on people's brains, but still it's really, really the level of attachment to that mm -hmm. particular substance, it's so high compared to the mm -hmm. to the other ones, right? Yes, that's exactly right. Do you think that in the future, um, there will be like drugs that significantly reduce the chemical dependency on substances and perhaps avoid the long treatments and hospitalizations? And do you see science taking us in that in that direction in the future? Yeah, I would say that's definitely the hope. But there's always a mixture of that as well. I think what a lot of scientists would say, would hopefully say, 
is that it's not going to be the medication alone. That also okay. needs to be integrated with other types of treatments and things like that as well. And then sometimes it's a situation dependent type of thing. So from our mm -hmm. standpoint, the agent that we're looking at, we're hoping that will be helpful, even specifically for people who might be navigating through substance use disorder, but may also have um, coexisting or comorbid as a field is a term that people use in the field might also have coexisting um, anxiety. There's a lot of evidence mm -hmm. that's showing that if you've tried to stop using the substance because of the changes that are happening in the brain that can actually increase your anxiety and increase depressed mood. So we would hope that we could have agents that could decrease the relapse, also diminish some of the anxiety effects, decrease that anxiety and also decrease some of the mood effects. But again, that can also be very helpful to integrate with other types of things as well. People have talked about that particularly around opioids, um, the opioid um, epidemic and opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. People have different feelings about medication for obvious reasons in some ways, because people feel like, well, I'm trying to stop using the substance. If I'm taking something else, am I just replacing the opioid mm -hmm. or whatever it is with another type of agent? So that is sometimes something that comes up. But people have also mentioned that sometimes it's helpful to use medication assisted treatment to actually at least help someone move past some of the initial um, withdrawal and initial uh, tendency for relapse, and then maybe get to a place where they might not need to use it as much, but that can often be combined with therapy. That can also be combined with just the importance of being in community as well. So these aren't things that need to happen and probably shouldn't happen in isolation. So I would say, yes, the medication should move things forward, but they still need to be integrated with everything else that's happening. A very good example of that outside of addiction is actually with depression. So some of my colleagues at Yale have been particularly involved in some of the work about new antidepressant medications. One of those that people may have heard about is ketamine. Um, S-ketamine is another related agent, but these can basically be very helpful for some individuals who, for instance, might have very severe depression or individuals who might have suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation. But the important thing that I've heard my colleagues often talk about is it's not just the ketamine by itself. Oftentimes that has to be paired with therapy and that can actually help people move through. We may talk about this as well, but we can also think about aspects of pairing these things with our spiritual practices, whether that's prayer and other types of things, being in community with other people who have a similar belief system and can remind us of God's promises to us. All of these things can be integrated and there's actually evidence showing the power of integrating those things. There's been evidence looking at just the power of even using a psychological tool like behavioral therapy and combining that with spiritual practices and how that can be more effective sometimes than either one by itself. So I know that's a little bit outside of your addiction question, but I think in general, that's something that I often try to talk about that it's important to integrate these different things, even though in the lab we're focused on the medication aspect. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely, doctor. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. And and thank you for mentioning that because in one of your lectures, you mentioned that how the role of, of community is so important when it comes to dealing with this type of mm -hmm. mental disorders, your work on depression and anxiety. And, and today, uh, it is very common to see people uh, use these terms as part of their vocabulary. I have a lot of friends and people around mm -hmm. me that they normally, it's like, it's very natural for them to, to use expressions such as, uh, I have anxiety, um, I'm depressed. It, it's so natural mm -hmm. for them. In, in, in the, my question is, is, how do we distinguish a person with the clinical depression and anxiety from someone who is not? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's become, as you mentioned, more commonplace. I mean, I'm thinking even as people will just say, oh, I'm depressed, but may not mean that they're clinically depressed or just feeling a little bit disappointed or sad, which is something that we all experience. So I think there are many important pieces there. One of the things from a clinical perspective that a lot of psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists will often say is that if you notice changes in someone's overall mood or their feelings or demeanor that is lasting for a long time. So for a period of weeks, for instance, where they just don't seem to have the same mood as they always had. So let's say there's someone who's particularly quiet. If they're quiet and they're usually quiet, that is not to be a concern, but let's say they're quiet and now they're just not responding to people as well as they used to, or, you know, doesn't, things don't seem to make them feel enjoy, things aren't enjoyable, things aren't sad, everything is just a little bit flat. If that's going on for weeks and weeks, or if somebody who is usually very vibrant, then now seems really 
quiet to themselves and not wanting to interact with others. So those types of things that are changed from someone's normal behavior, when something like that is lasting for a period of weeks, then it's often helpful to ask that person if they'd be willing to see somebody. So at that point, you need to have some type of mental health provider who can intervene and just listen and hear what that person is feeling, why they may be feeling that way. The same thing with anxiety as well. So all of us will have some level of feeling anxious about something, and that can be helpful. If we're a student and we're about to take an exam, we should probably have a little bit of anxiety about that that can help us prepare, except for maybe a few of those who are gifted in a way that I am not, that can just walk into an exam without preparing. Most of us will feel some level of anxiety. But if it's anxiety that's healthy and normal, once we have taken that test, then the anxiety, the anxious feelings will dissipate. It can be a problem if those feelings then do not dissipate and they become generalizable. So if I am a student again, and every time I walk into the school building, I feel an increase in anxiety. That again is then a time to talk to somebody. If something is again outside of kind of my normal day-to-day -day activities, or in both cases, both with anxiety or feeling down, if those things are interfering with our day-to-day -day activities. So it's preventing me from going to the places that I normally go to, from doing the work that I'm supposed to do, doing the schoolwork I'm supposed to do, that is also another sign when it's good to talk to a mental health provider. That can be a social worker, that can be a counselor, it can be a psychologist, it can be a psychiatrist, but to really have those conversations and to have that conversation with someone who's willing to listen to the person's story or listen to your story and not just try and put you into a category without actually hearing what may be happening in your life. But again, the bottom line, when things are going on for quite a while, a period of weeks, and if they are detracting from someone's ability to engage in their day-to-day -day normal activities. So continuing with this topic, doctor, um, I know that you're a person of faith. And unfortunately, in religious communities, uh, there is uh, this ignorance, right, a poor um, approach to such conditions, depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. as we mentioned. And in many of them, mm -hmm. the existence of yeah. these conditions is completely denied. And so when people are asked mm -hmm. to focus only on their spirituality, ignoring medical approaches. So what can you tell us uh, about this, doctor? Yeah, I think it's, it's an important conversation. And you're right, it, in some instances, it's not acknowledged as much as it should be. So I think it's been important for us to be able to make sure that that improves going forward. And I've continued to see things on both sides where there are communities who are acknowledging it and integrating different ways to approach mental health. But then there are still situations, um, even talking with um, Dr. Tama Bryant, who is a past president of the American Psychological Association, and sharing that she, even in within the last year, has had people who have come up to her and said that their pastor wasn't taking their mental health seriously um, because the pastor had already prayed over that situation and didn't know why the parishioner was still talking to mental health providers, for instance. I heard those same stories years ago with students who said they had family members who were navigating through depression and anxiety, but were being told that the only reason they weren't getting better is because they weren't praying hard enough. So in a way, ignoring all the tools that God has already given us to be able to address our mental health, including prayer, but not prayer alone by itself. So thankfully, I've seen things on the other side, too, where I have colleagues who are actually working in collaboration with pastors to provide some of those services. And they're actually providing those services within the church setting in small groups. So people who are navigating through depression, who then have access to therapy within a church setting because of a partnership between the mental health provider and the pastor and the ministers in that place, or people who are being able to navigate through addiction, again, in a church setting, something that we don't typically think about, but okay. from those who are doing that work, sometimes the recovery rates are actually better wow. within the church than they would be if that person were to go to a facility elsewhere. You already have that common ground of community, you have that level of trust that actually helps people move through. But it does also require a level of trust between the mental health provider and the pastor or the minister to, to also acknowledge and say, there are people in my congregation who are navigating through addiction. Sometimes some of the pastors are in a little bit of denial and will say that doesn't exist in my church, even though that's probably not actually true. So there is some community aspect that has to be there as well. Um, but again, seeing those things move forward and then also knowing churches 
that have actually had counseling centers that they have worked with, Christian counseling centers, to be able to say, well, this is a resource that we have for people in our congregation, but also for our leaders as well. If we think about pastors and ministers and all the service that they do, and all sometimes all the burdens that they are carrying as they're listening to everything that everybody in their congregation is going through, and to also have tools for themselves to know when to say yes and when to also take pause and have a time of Sabbath for themselves to also be able to continue in the work. So it's important for everybody, not just the parishioners and the congregants, but also the leaders as well. Yeah, there are a few things that come to mind. One is a pamphlet that was developed by the American Psychiatric Association in partnership with a lot of faith leaders. And so they call it the Mental Health Guide for Faith Leaders. Okay. Um, it's something that's freely, freely available online. But in sending that to different people and reading through it, even though it's written for faith leaders, I found that that is very helpful for everybody to just okay. have perspective and think about these things. Another organization that has done a lot nationally is the National Alliance on uh, Mental Illness, or NAMI, N-A-M-I. Um, their website is nami.org. That's a grassroots organization that actually exists in all 50 states in the U.S., and so there are local groups in that organization that can point people to resources. That organization is also very good because they provide resources not only for those who are navigating through mental health challenges, but also for their family members or loved ones, which can be difficult if somebody in the family is experiencing, for instance, severe mental illness, let's just say something like schizophrenia for the very first time. It's going to be very difficult for the family members to know how to... Right navigate through that, what's the best way to provide support. That in and of itself can be very stressful, can sometimes feel isolating. And so NAMI is very helpful in bringing communities together and saying, these are the resources that you all have at your fingertips as family members to actually walk through this as well. Sometimes there'll be support groups where different families will share their experiences. Again, bringing together aspects of community. Um, and then I would say, just depending on where people are within the country, sometimes there's local organizations that also equip people. I know in Durham, North Carolina, the Divinity School at Duke has done a lot of work with pastors throughout the state of North Carolina to equip them. I know also in, for instance, the state of Indiana, there's a group called the Center for Congregations, which again, pulls together um, different parishioners uh, and, or different um parishes from across the state, across different denominations to have some of these conversations together. Um, I imagine that that also happens in other places of, within the country as well. Um, in Texas, I imagine there may be some local organizations. So sometimes it can be helpful just to, to, to reach out even to a group like NAMI and ask them if they know some of the local resources that are there as well, because I think that's really important, as you mentioned. And I don't know as much about what is available in Mexico, but I imagine there may be for individuals um, like yourself who have some ties to both uh, the U.S. and Mexico, there may be a way to brid build bridges as well. And there may be international organizations that are also focused on that. The last piece that I'll say, I have a good friend who actually has done some of this work um, in India, so okay. not here in North America. But one of the things that he did there was actually just to, to get a lot of the youth together to be and help them be better listeners to one another. So because especially in India, the, the ratio of mental health providers to those in the population is a large gap. So training a lot of youth to actually wow. be really good listeners and to, to be supportive has also been really important. And it's actually been very transformative because that's something that has spread across millions, even before you have a mental health provider involved. So they've done a lot of work with their group called Live Jam and have integrated the faith aspect as well. So that's also another way that in the midst of some resources that they didn't always have available, they are still able to help move things forward. Moving on to the topic of faith, I want to start first with your journey as a Christian scientist, as a young scientist. What has your journey been like from a young age, starting a career in medicine, and at the same time being a believer? Where did it all start for you? Uh, what led you to, to study science? And when did you adopt also the Christian faith in, in your life? Yeah, from the scientific standpoint, I think it was a curiosity that I had. Mm -hmm that I almost didn't even know that I had early on. So initially, I would say, you know, growing up with parents who moved to the U.S. from Ghana, um, I didn't actually take in all of even their, their emphasis on schooling and those types of things. Oftentimes, I was just trying to do the bare minimum that I needed to do to get by, which was not the best approach, but <laughs> for some reason, that was the way I was um, approaching things. But at some point, that didn't work very well. I ended up failing some 
science projects. And that was the, that was the wake up call that I needed to actually start to put effort into my work. Um, and so that was middle school, eighth grade, ninth grade. And so we had a transition there and then became very, um, just curious about how things work in general. So at the school I was at, we were fortunate to be able to have an eighth grade internship that we could do with different people. So I was actually curious about engineering, um, mm -hmm. and went to visit an engineer, um, uh, but didn't find it as exciting as I thought I would. Uh, but I think still that curiosity for how things work was still there. And so once I eventually got to college and was able to get involved in some research and think about aspects of neuroscience, it was very overwhelming, but I think I had still had that curiosity there as well. So I was talking to different professors, trying to decide what I want to do as a major, had a psychology professor who would take all the students out to lunch during the year. And mm -hmm. so I had the chance to sit down with him and was trying to figure out if I want to do psychology or biology. He actually told me to do biology and not psychology, which was a little bit surprising to me to hear coming from a psychology professor, because that made me wonder if I wasn't good enough <laughs> for psychology. <laughs> right. But I think that he saw just the, the curiosity that I had about biology and thought that might be a better place for me to ask some of the questions that were starting to come to mind. So I was fortunate to be able to get some good experiences doing volunteer work at a mental health hospital near the college where I was going to school while also getting experience doing research actually with nicotine and seeing how nicotine impacts memory and how that actually also relates to medications like antipsychotic medications. So I had some good experiences overall and then had some people who were very good about mentoring giving me opportunities to learn research because there was still a lot to learn. Um, and then even after graduating from college, spending a few years in that lab, really learning more about the research and also realizing that there was a lot more that I wanted to learn, which helped me eventually decide on applying to graduate school and going to a graduate program. So I'd say that was a scientific piece that came into play. And that's just continued over the years as I felt like I've been studying God's creation. But in terms of my faith perspective, again, going back to those eighth grade middle school years I was talking about, um, I feel like that was also very important around the same time of when I was actually realizing I need to put time into my studies. So um, around seventh grade, eighth grade, I think that was where I had a transition of really asking, is this something I really believe or is this something that is just my parents' faith? And so spending time in different places, actually working with people who had experienced homelessness um, in different parts of the, um, the city and then ministering and um, trying to share um, aspects of Christianity with the, the kids in that environment. There was something that was different. I noticed that the people who were there had chosen to be there. Some of them could have had very successful jobs elsewhere, maybe doing something in the corporate world or the business world, but they felt like they had a calling to be there and to serve that community. I met an individual who didn't have a home. He was homeless at the time, but he would still give away half of his breakfast every morning because he felt like God called him to do that and that he had that opportunity. So that struck me as very strange at that time. I was thinking, why would somebody <laughs> act that way? But it also helped me to think about what was different. And what I realized is these people felt like they had a connection to God. They weren't just trying to obey the rules or do the right thing, but they had uh, consistent times of prayer and felt like the God was speaking to them in certain ways. They basically felt like they had a relationship that was not just based on doing good things. And so for me, that very, that very much so challenged me. It also changed the way I started to read the Bible. As I was reading the Bible, I was starting to feel more like God was speaking to me through the Bible rather than me reading the Bible to just check a box or to make sure, okay, the Bible, I have to do this and not do that, do this and not do that. And so that was the beginning of a journey that continued, I would say, throughout college. There were still times when I doubted. I went through my phase of, is this still real? Is this not real? It took time to really pray over it and just had an overwhelming sense of God's presence and his faithfulness to me in certain situations. And then over time, I had a lot of confirmation about those things as well even as I transitioned to having a faculty position at Yale years later, um, having some confusion about whether that was the path to take. There were some delays that were happening. I specifically remember sitting down um, at a library where I was doing some of my work to actually pray about that and had a very clear sense that God was telling me to stop trying to figure everything out 
stop trying to apply to all these jobs, try, stop trying to make everything work. Things have been going on for a few months. I still didn't know where things were going to go, but I felt like I had a very clear sense from God at that point. And then later that day was when I actually got the job offer at Yale. So that felt like a very strong confirmation wow. that God was telling me to stop. I didn't know at that moment that was because the offer was about to come, but I definitely had that clear sense. And so there were other things like that of just confirmation that I felt like I was directing me in a certain way. And it was my um, responsibility or option, depending on how you think about it, to, to follow it in that way. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I have a lot of questions, and especially with your journey. <laughs> I see that you have the blessing, as I mentioned, of, of having your father as a scientific colleague. And how important is the figure of, of the man, the father, and the community in general from a mental and social aspect? Because I'm pretty sure that he played a big role and he still plays a role in, in, your, in your life. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, from a personal level, that's always been really important. Um, to me, just even, I mean, both of my parents leading by example, um, and also them coming to the United States from another country, everything they sacrificed um, to be here. They both met um, in medical school in Ghana, but my mom took 12 years off between her residency and then going back um, to work to to raise me and my younger siblings. So I wow. definitely have that example. And I think that just speaks to the importance of both of them actually feel like they were also following God's direction and guidance, um, even through difficult decisions that they had to make. Um, and then me having that example in so many ways. And you mentioned my father. I told him growing up I didn't want to do anything related to what he does. And he's a psychiatrist. And I still ended up as a, a professor of psychiatry. So I wasn't very <laughs> successful in, in veering away. Um, but I think that speaks volumes about um, just the example and the importance of that. Um, from a research standpoint, I haven't done as much around um, the father figure and mental health, but there are a lot of people who have done that work and have just talked about the importance of a stable family situation, but then also the importance of having that father figure as well. And that's not to say that those who of us who may not have had that uh, stable family situation, that that can still be achieved, but having people who will step into some of those roles um, to be able to lead, to be able to guide. I mean, there's so much from the neuroscience perspective that does talk about and does show us the evidence of the importance of having examples that will lead us and the importance of having strong social bonds, where that's within the family, and in other places as well, it gets back to that question you asked about how those social bonds can actually help prevent people from, and even if you look at the rodents, from using excessive amount of substances or looking for that validation elsewhere. Um, so that's definitely an important piece and something that from a holistic perspective, I've th been thankful to be able to be involved in and thinking about um, just the importance of men in the lives of their families, in the lives of their children, in their communities, and in so many ways, how it's really important to say that this is the role that we're here to serve, not to be to be um, domineering, as it were, not to be belligerent. And even as we think about these aspects of mental health, so important. I've had so many conversations recently um, with other men in particular talking about the importance of leading by example in terms of sharing our emotions as men and being able to process through those things and to be able to say when we feel aspects of fear or aspects of joy or aspects of shame. And all those things are really important for our mental wellness in general. And when we have mental health challenges and also our examples for our children and for others in the community. So I think there's a large onus on all of us, but especially for men to be able to, to be vulnerable and honest and to talk about the power of those pieces rather than pretending that those emotions don't exist rather than uh, pushing them down rather than saying that men aren't allowed to cry rather than only showing aspects of strength is so important in so many different ways. Again, is speaking now about faith in God and continue with this conversation, I wanted to ask you uh, about your process of concealing and reconciling science and faith in your life. What kind of arguments help you during that time? Or have you never really needed arguments uh, to solidify your, your beliefs or your faith in, in God? Yeah, I would say in high school, it was more so on the philosophical and trying to either, so having a, a good friend who uh, would say he was atheist and me as someone who's a Christian and each of us trying to convince the other <laughs> that the other person was, was correct, <laughs> which I didn't ever think was all that effective, but I think it's also 
or our, our mindset was as high school students as we were trying to understand what that meant for ourselves as well. And so I think in high school, most of my conversations often tended to be that way. In retrospect, that probably wasn't the most effective, and we shifted that over time as well. Um, but just also trying to gain my own foundation in what it means to actually um, speak about the faith to other people, to defend the faith as we are uh, called to do in Scripture, and thinking about that in different ways. I think things shifted as I was in college and as I was um, later doing my PhD work, where I also noticed that even though that can be helpful, a lot of times people would have a lot of intellectual oppositions to the faith that were actually not based in intellectual arguments. They were actually based on things they had experienced in life, hard things they had gone through. I mean, I remember one individual who had lost um, their father to at a young age and felt like, um, why say something like, why didn't the man upstairs intervene? And so knowing that those types of pains were there and knowing that there were family situations other people had gone through, there always seemed to be a story behind why someone opposed the idea of God. And even though they might have talked about it from a scientific standpoint, intellectual standpoint, building relationships with people often helped to at least have those more meaningful conversations about what really happened in that person's life that led them to make that conclusion rather than just trying to have an intellectual argument alone. Um, so that had, has definitely been my experience in science. And then I've also had other individuals who some of those experiences sometimes have been because people have told them growing up that they can't um, have a belief in God and actually pursue science. So people felt like some people felt like they had to pick one or the other. And so those individuals who then saw me working at lab initially felt very confused because it didn't fit what they had been told. But then they were also very curious at the same time. And they were able to watch, to ask questions, sometimes to come to a church service with me. And some of those individuals actually eventually returned to having a perspective of faith and actually accepted Christ, became Christians. So part of it has also been not always saying something or not always saying a lot, but sometimes just trying to lead by example and to ask questions and to invite. And so for me, those have been the types of things that have come up. Oftentimes, there'll be a lot of oppositions that people will voice. They might not always voice them directly to me. Um, but again, just trying to have that attitude of just learning why people got to that place and being willing to have those conversations with them has been particularly helpful. And I was listening uh, last night, your conversation with Dr. Dickey. I was impressed to see his journey, but also how committed the people, the community, his patients, they were everything. Mm -hmm. And after the end of the day, after working so hard, he always asked this question to himself, like, God, did I serve uh, my patients and my community mm -hmm. uh, according to your standards, not my standards or my community? As, a, as someone in such an important position, how do you manage to maintain a stance that is a blessing to others in academia uh, and in the public sphere and while maintaining your your faith. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, part of it is doing that one step at a time, but part of that is also mm -hmm. doing things in community. So you also talked about Dr. DK, you know, thinking about whether he had served his patients in the way that God had called him to. I think there's a lot of power that comes from that and people can still sense that and appreciate that. So if I'm doing my work, you know, to use a, a Bible verse as unto the Lord and not as unto man, that's still going to have effects on how people perceive me in different places. So if they know that I'm there to serve, if I'm there to invest and actually build relationships with people, that also goes a long way um, as well. And then people, I think, can, can sense that and then sometimes even ask questions about why that is or what the motivation for that is um, while not compromising aspects of my faith as well. So still being willing to be able to have those conversations. I think one thing that's been helpful um, just participating in events on different campuses is this ability to be able to have conversations, honest conversations, um, while not necessarily agreeing with every single thing that somebody else has said. So one of the schools in the U.S. that is doing that particularly well is Dartmouth College. And so I got to speak at one of their events. Uh, they call it the Dartmouth Dialogues. Um, and basically what they want to do was to, to model how can we have a conversation about an important topic like mental health, but have two different perspectives. And the two different perspectives don't need to agree on everything, but they can still stay rooted in their convictions. So the event 
um, was coordinated by some students on that campus, was also hosted by the Veritas Forum. And it was called, Is Mindfulness Enough? A Christian and Buddhist Perspective on Mental Health. So they had me to come and share from my perspective as a neuroscientist and also as a Christian, but they had another professor there who does work within the realm of religion and is also someone who practices Buddhism to talk about aspects of mental health and mindfulness. And so in that instance, we were able to say we're here on a university campus where people have different perspectives, but we're also here to show our investment in people and in making sure that people have good mental wellness and good mental health, but also to be able to share it from our convictions. Yeah. So there was no compromise in that regard, but we also were here to hear from one another as well and not to say, not to diminish one another. So I think a lot of it has to be really intentional to be able to have those conversations. And in that same scenario, people were asking the same question that you asked. How do you actually do this? How do you actually stay true to your convictions and serve people and still do the work that you do? So I think that was a very helpful thing for them as well. And it was the same answer that I gave in terms of being intentional, building community, learning to listen to others' perspectives while still sharing your perspective as well. I would like to ask you about the mental benefits of faith in people. Many atheists constantly attack faith as something toxic to people's minds. Mm. Uh, is, is this what uh, science indicates, doctor? Yeah, it's a really it's a really good question that people are often going back and forth on and trying to understand. There have been, so I'll give you an example, there have been some studies that have done been done looking at prayer in particular. But those, it's often, as we say sometimes in science, complicated because some studies will say that the prayer that people didn't know was happening was beneficial for other people's health. Some show that it had no effect. Some show that it actually made it actually was correlated with having things be worse. So that component was kind of all over the place. But there has been a lot of consistent evidence just showing the importance and the power of being part of a faith community um, and how that can, again, being part of a community can help people navigate through. Dr. DK talked about a lot of the research showing the benefit of what he called spiritually informed cognitive behavioral therapy. So taking cognitive behavioral therapy from psychology and tying that to a practice like prayer or attending religious services. So that would suggest that those things can actually be helpful and move together. Um, but it, it's an ongoing conversation and question that people have. Sometimes people have actually done studies to say, well, what happens in the brain that's different? If somebody doesn't say they have any type of prayer life, other people who say they meditate and those who say they pray to God. In this instance, they actually exposed all the individuals to a very light shock to see what their pain threshold was. Interestingly, those who meditated had a higher threshold. They could withstand more pain. Those who prayed to God could withstand even more, could sustain even more pain. And they had different activity in their brain. So the ones who prayed to a higher being or to God actually engaged different aspects of their brain more than those who did not. And that was tied to how much of a pain threshold they could actually sustain. So there's evidence that, that, that these things actually do impact our brains as well. I'm just going to share another story. We had done an event around God, mental health, and wellness, and it brought together uh, mental health providers like psychologists with pastors and other faith leaders. And I remember a pastor asking one of the psychologists about his practice of reading the scripture over himself and reminding himself what God has told him about himself and asked, asked the uh, psychologist, is that a form of, of some type of cognitive behavioral therapy? And the, the psychologist said, yes, I think it is because you're changing your perspective about yourself and how you right. approach situations. So for those who would say that, you know, the, the aspects of faith is, is toxic or detrimental to our mental health, I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests otherwise. Of course, at the same time, I would also say and have to acknowledge that sometimes the way that we practice our faith can be detrimental to our mental health. And that's not to say mm -hmm. that that is something that we blame God for, for instance. So for instance, if someone has been through a traumatic situation, sometimes certain pastors will be well-intentioned, but not have the training in how to help somebody or knowledge of how to help somebody through a trauma. And they'll actually make things worse by unintentionally re-traumatizing that person 
by what they have him talk through wow. or think about. So in that instance, someone could easily say, yes, the way that person practiced their faith actually was hurting this person, even if that was or was not the intention. But I think we have to be careful and not say because that situation happened to say we blame that on the faith or we blame that on God. That was a situation that happened and that calls us to be able to do better and again, to partner together as well. So it's a really important topic, um, but I think it's so easy sometimes if someone has one bad experience then to to overgeneralize that, to say that, oh, look, faith and mental health or faith and science now can't go together because of this one bad experience that I had. Um, I have another question, doctor. Are we more than biochemical reactions or can everything be explained in material terms? Yeah. So for me, I would say, I mean, this gets to the philosophical and aspects of the soul that we, we are more than just our biochemical processes. And I think most of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we'll say at this point in time, and people could argue about whether that could change there, we can't explain everything just by thinking about the biology. Now, there's two ways that people could respond to that. Some people could say it's just because we don't know enough and maybe someday we'll be able to. Or we could say that it's because we can't know all that and there's something supernatural outside of us that we will never be able to explain, which is the camp that I would fall into. Um, but yeah, so I would say there's much more to us than just what we can see. And you made a good point about how that's been difficult just in terms of the neuroscience because this is in a different realm, but we can't see our brain the same way that we can see when we have a broken finger or even the same way with imaging that we can see what happens in the heart. We can do imaging with the brain, but it's not to the same level of what we can do elsewhere. So sometimes there are things which are beyond <laughs> what we can see. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not true and they're not important and not their guiding aspects of our lives. All right. So I'm going to start with the first question. Mm -hmm. What advice uh, will you give to young people in Latin America who face economic, social, and political challenges to, to get ahead? Yeah, really good question. The first thing that comes to mind, again, this actually goes back to some of the science as well, um, because in so many situations like that where there are challenges, people have also found, and this might not be surprising, how important it is to be able to serve others. So you were talking about that as well. And that's often very hard to do in difficult situ situations. I mentioned the individual who was giving away half of his breakfast every morning, even though he had so little. Mm -hmm. um, but that's so important in terms of building community. And also from the neuroscience, actually, this shows that that has dramatic impacts on the brain, it actually helps people navigate through different circumstances as well. Um, but for that question, I mean, I'm saying this as someone who is not currently walking through that. So there is a little bit of uh, acknowledgement that I'm not in a specific context, but sometimes I think it can also be helpful if people are able to even have small things that contribute to, you know, a sense of service, a sense of um, well-being, a sense of purpose. And sometimes that can be small things. So I know sometimes um, for people that I've interacted with that are in difficult situations that want to just make a really huge impact um, and just get to that place very quickly. Sometimes in those circumstances, it can be uh, easy for those individuals to forget about the small steps that happen along the way, whether that's helping somebody out who needs help, whether that's a perspective someone has about their own experience and their own faith journey and sharing that with somebody else, whether that's having that small word of encouragement. And then for those who, again, this is assuming, but for those who would say that they're following God, God may use that to actually build somebody's character and position them for something that may come up later on down the road. So many instances where people said I was in this very hard situation, but I was doing these little things to help these different people out. And I didn't realize that was God using me in these people's lives, but also preparing me later on to do that in a way that I didn't anticipate or didn't imagine. Again, I know that's much easier for me to say not being in the situation, but that's one thing that comes to mind just in terms of being faithful in the midst of the challenge. And so many times when I've seen people later on say the reason that I'm able to be so effective and so powerful in this whatever realm that might be is because I saw God use me in small ways in the challenge situation and give me tools that I could use to help others as well. So hopefully that's encouraging to people, even if it's not necessarily concrete steps of how to move out of that situation. Yeah, one one thing to add there. So I, I mean, mm -hmm. that's something I've thought about quite a bit. This was 
four or five years ago, we actually did a, a big event in a major city um, in the U.S. And we had it was around the God Mental Health and Wellness. We had a okay. um, a hip hop artist who won Grammy awards. We had an NFL player. We had someone who worked for National Alliance on Mental Illness. You know, hundreds of people showed up to that event, and I'm sure they were all looking up to those individuals. But the only reason that all of them were there was because they had had something very difficult they had gone through, either with their own mental health or with a family member with severe mental illness and things like that. And so it was almost, it's, it was backwards of what we would have expected. Oh, look at these people who are wonderful. They're up on this platform, but they're there because they went through painful experience and they had God be faithful to them. So exactly what you were saying. Um, but that sometimes is really powerful and really grounding to see from that perspective. What are your hobbies and interests outside of uh, academia? Oh, I like yeah. that question. <laughs> so it's shifted. Away. <laughs> Music has always been one of my hobbies. So I started out, um, my mom trained me and my younger siblings to play the piano. Then later in uh, elementary school, secondary school, I picked up the cello. Then later in high school, picked up the bass guitar, then acoustic guitar. So music has always been a hobby. Now it's more listening than playing, but there are aspects of that that are still there and being able to pick apart different things. I also did run the soundboard for a few years um, at church services, so that was also nice. I felt like that was that was me playing different all the instruments at once because I had control over <laughs> the sound, <laughs> which I don't know if that's good or bad, but that was a piece as well. Um, so music wow. is definitely a hobby and something that it's nice to be able to integrate the hobby with the work if I'm you know, doing a writing project and listening to something that I really enjoy listening to. I'd say that is definitely there as well. Sports have always been a hobby. Again, not playing as much as I did when I was a little bit younger, but basketball has definitely been one as well. And then just, um, I would say the outdoors, spending time uh, outdoors, either if that's in a hike or one of my most treasured uh, places is always going to a beach um, and just looking out over the water, or over the ocean. Um, that's always been a time of reflection for me. Um, so yeah, and then different things come up at different times. I'd say music is always somehow in the mix somewhere. That's definitely one of my main my main hobbies. What's what study methods or discipline uh, guide your work? It's a little bit of a lot of different things. I mean, within the lab, the field of neuroscience is what people would say is very interdisciplinary, meaning it pulls from mm. different types of scientific disciplines. So some of that is the neuroscience, Some of that is something called pharmacology, which really mm -hmm. deals with how medications act on the body and how the body acts on medications. Some of that is physiology. So thinking about how uh, the brain works in different ways, whether that's brain chemicals that are released or um, electrical charges that happen in our brain. Some of that is what is known as cellular and molecular biology. So as the name implies, it's focusing on cells within our body and cells in the brain. And so we actually integrate a lot of these different tools from different approaches when we're doing our neuroscience research. But then the work that I do in general also has aspects of psychology, as you heard about, as I was talking about mm -hmm. aspects of faith. If you think about faith as a discipline and thinking about our spiritual practices, our reading of scriptures and those types of things, and the aspects of sociology and thinking about how we interact with each other as human beings. Um, so again, it's a lot of different things that are tied in together, and I'm fortunate to be able to interact with people who have more expertise in those different disciplines to be able to tie these things together. We can work together to all actually help uh, bring about societal good in some ways as well. Uh, what advice do you give to those who struggle with their beliefs? My first piece of advice is to make sure that people don't feel like there's something wrong with them if they are struggling in that mm. belief, because okay. it's good to acknowledge that it's better to say, oh, I'm not sure about this and let me really investigate it than to pretend that that struggle isn't there. And part of the reason I say that is because that's the same answer I have for people when we're talking about mental health. If someone has a mental health challenge, it's much worse if they ignore it and pretend it's not there because it's going to get worse. In the same way, if someone is not sure about aspects of their faith, it's good to address that, to have an honest conversation, to be able to talk about that with other people um, and to have people walk through that with you. I even mentioned that in my own story in college and not being exactly sure at all times, but really um, praying about that and having God show himself true in a very tangible way. 
Um, as I've gotten older, the other thing that I've noticed is that most of the people that I would consider to be strongest in their faith or people who are having an impact on thousands of people or writing books who are uh, just seem to be tapped into what God is telling them, most of those people went through either did not grow up in a church setting or grew up in a church setting and went the extreme opposite direction running away from that and then came back. And it's almost so much more powerful to see, not that for those of us who may not have had that experience, but to see how God worked in those lives. And because they had periods of doubt and went the other direction, the other direction, their conviction is so strong because they have seen God really show up and show himself to them in a way they would say, if it wasn't God, there's no way I would be in the situation and I wouldn't have come back to this place. So wow. in that sense, again, I say it's not, we can sometimes feel like, oh, something's wrong with me. This is really bad, but that doesn't, that period of wondering does not have to be the end of the story. And the last question, how do you define Christ and what does he mean to you? Yeah, for me, I would say uh, for the second question, Christ means that access to God and having that relationship. Um, and again, it really goes back. That question hits me because it goes back to all, all the way back to high school when I feel like, or middle school, when I had that transition between I need to do all the right things. I feel like I'm doing the right things, but ignoring things that I knew I had not done right and trying to push those away and pretend that they weren't there, but shifting to having a personal relationship with Christ and really being able to accept that aspect of forgiveness because in truth, if I was really staying in my, I'm doing a good person mentality, I knew there were significant things that I felt like I couldn't even forgive myself for. So right. having Christ to be that sacrifice, to allow me to have that forgiveness, to experience that forgiveness, and then to have a personal relationship with God has been life changing in that sense, and also perspective changing. And for me, that's something that I feel like I'm also called to live out on a day-to-day -day basis as I interact with people throughout the world who are also God's children. And what is God calling me to do to serve in those people's lives from that perspective of how much I've been giving, how much I've been given and to pass that on to others. I always tell people in the work itself, I also feel like I'm studying God's creation. And so again, having access to the tools to study God's creation and having that personal relationship with Christ is the foundation of everything.